Morning, wherever in the world you are. This is Lisa Berkeley, and this is the Reaction to Response webinar series. And we were birthed through the Charter of Compassion Women and Girls sector, hoping to provide conversation and dialogue with people from around the world looking for love and care-based solutions in a time of chaos rather than fear-based reactions. Um, before we begin and before I introduce our guest, I just would like to say a little bit more about Charter for Compassion, um, who is really who holds us all together. Uh, Charter for Compassion is a network of networks with more than 400 cities and regions of compassion in over 50 countries with nearly 1,700 partners, which is organized in 11 sectors of society, and Women and Girls was the 11th sector. Um, before I say any more, though, I am going to um, show you uh, a little bit about after, after today's call, we will be having a um, webinar, a further webinar, that is, uh, called the After Party. And let me put on the screen. I don't know. Can you see that? Are we no. screen sharing properly? I don't know. We're having a little bit of technical issues here. Can you, can you all see that? Okay, I think so. Yes, there we go. Okay. Uh, anyway, so while while I'm continuing this conversation, you can jot down the information to join us in the after party. Um, and so to continue, we want to do a little bit of housekeeping. If you're having any technological issues, you can go to zoom.us, and they're very, very helpful there. And um, I'd like to give a little bit of thanks for the people about working behind the scenes. Mimi Hicklin, Betsy Spano, Bria Lathorpe, uh, sorry, Brianna Lithorpe and Susan DeGaia. As always, you guys are an awesome team. Thank you so much for everything you do. Also, um, one of the things we like to address in reaction to response, uh, we like to continue to be in alignment with the women and girls sector and the Charter for Compassion with advancing uh, the UN Sustainable Goals. And for this call in particular, um, we will be addressing uh, the following eight uh, sustainable goals, good good health and well-being, and that ties into when we're a full and happy and freer human, we feel better, have better health and well-being. Or addressing gender equality uh, across the line, very fluid in that. Uh, and when we know too that when women and girls and men and boys and all of our our LGBTQTE plus community. Uh, are embraced for who they are. We have decent work and economic growth and positive industry innovation and infrastructure. We also have reduced inequalities. We're able then to build sustainable cities and communities. And also if we're all learning to be living in a pluralistic and accepting world of one another, we'll have peace, justice, and strong institutions. And of course, partnership for obtaining these goals. Okay, that was a rather long introduction. Uh, so with that, I'm going to switch now to our guest speaker, Anthony DeSigli, also known as Axe. And um, you can go to the charter to read the bio of him. Um, and with that, I'm going to just jump into our conversation. Um, okay, so that's one second, because right now I'm going to reach out to Mimi. Um, Mimi, I think we are having some... Right now, the only thing I think we may be seeing is the logo. Um, so. The logo. The logo, right. For Mimi's voice behind the screen. <laughs> I think For normally we're supposed to be in. Oh, sorry. Okay. I've been just texted. You can see you all just fine. All right. Excellent. So without further ado, for the second time, uh, Axe, let me introduce you and how are you today? And you're like, just also to recognize too that you're calling us or participating in from London. Thank you, Lisa. Good morning <laughs> or good evening or good afternoon, wherever you happen to be. Um, before we start, I'd just like to say something. I I was showering earlier, and, and you know, as, as things happen, you know, that tends to be where some real thoughts come. And I was suddenly actually very humbled by the prospect of this call. Because I, if I step back to be asked by you to go on this call, is it's actually a very great honor to be considered an ambassador of a part of our kind. So I'd just like to thank you for that. Oh. You're welcome. Thank you. 
So um, without further ado, I think we should just jump into today's quest, uh, today's discussion. Sorry, I'm fighting a flu and a little bit uh, stumbly with my words. Anyway, um, so, so originally we were talking, we, when we were planning today's call, it was about the role of the masculine and feminine qualities of which are extremely important. But really, when you look at the whole spectrum of humans, um, there's, it's not just about masculine and feminine. Um, and, and so it, when then, when you and I spoke, you made a beautiful comment about a monkey suit that we're all living in. And so let's, let's, uh, let's start from there. <laughs> With okay. Fred, we're in love. Right. So yeah, the monkey suit, the monkey suit is something I've become quite passionate about. Um, the reason for that is, I think, in our search for this movement away from reacting to be able to respond, in, in moving away, in moving from a, an unconscious to a conscious way of living, we frequently start in the wrong place, uh -huh. in denial. And, you know, I, I might draw an analogy here. I mean, I don't know who on the call has seen the film 2001, A Space Odyssey. Um... To, to go to the, the relevant part, you know, uh, some astronauts leave Earth on the way to Jupiter in a spacecraft which is sentient. And their mission is to investigate something which is affecting human evolution. The sentient spacecraft, and bearing in mind this was produced in the 60s, it was, it was a little forward thinking, decides that the humans are actually a threat to its mission. So it starts to eliminate them. Now, this might seem like a strange starting point, but that's often the relationship that we have with our bodies. We're at war with them. And it's something that I've been investigating and living through very personally over the last couple of years is actually coming to, to a realization and, and of the implications of actually having a body. You know, I don't associate myself with my body. Mm -hmm. um, there, there is a strong symbiotic relationship between them, but we are not one and the same thing. You know, it, it's and just to give some context to this, you know, I uh, my my personal reality is that we are spirit living in matter and not trying to do the other way around, and that you know, it's in the living in matter that things are, are proven and therefore are actually the most beautiful because they are, by definition, real. Mm -hmm. Turn that thought in, in, into reality. Now, in this context, why, why is this important? Well, from my perspective, it's important because we, at the moment, tend to regard ourselves, one, as being very much associated with our body, and two, in many cases, not everyone, and two, also, we are, to a large extent, from a, a social point of view, in denial about our place in the ecosystem of the planet. Mm -hmm. We tend to think we humans are different. We tend to think that we have unique characteristics like domination, um, like intelligence, uh, all sorts of things. And that denial stops us from making any progress. Now, I'd like to turn the clock back a little bit. So four and a half billion years ago, two heavenly bodies collided, and the result was planet Earth and the moon. Mm -hmm. And we're the children of that collision, and more, we're the children of the evolution that took place subsequently. Nature went through a tremendous series of trial and error, to get to a point where we have these amazing bodies that allow us to carry intelligence around, to move, to look at things. After all of that time. And we also assume that we have complete autonomy in that process, which is actually not the case. That the more that we dig into neuroscience, the more that we dig into genetics, the more that we dig into epigenetics and the influence of the environment on genetics, the more we start to, to realize actually how much comes preloaded in 
our body and how much we have to deal with. And the reason I started with the 2001 piece was I sure as hell would have liked somebody at the beginning of my life to turn around and say, hey, Axe, you are in a biological spacesuit. It's got intelligence, it's got uh, experience, it's got memory, it's got energy of its own. What, learn how to work with it. Mm -hmm. So that raises some really interesting questions, but there's another question too, and I've gotten a little bit of feedback from people who are watching. Can you go back a little bit? Cause it seems that part of your, there we go. We can't, we can't, you became less than a talking head. <laughs> so, okay. Great, but we do want to hear the sound, which is super, super important too. So fabulous. So back to this, if you were given instructions, you know, here's your spacesuit, and it's been it has this tremendous history. Also, in that in that history, though, is the the cultural interpretation of gender, and what does it mean? Okay, so in this life, you're born in this body, which is a clearly male body, and that means that there are going to be people who make all kinds of assumptions about you, but not only that, generations and generations of what it means to be a, in a male body are then thrust upon you and also within your body because of cellular memory and intergenerational memory. I mean, that plays into it too, no? Absolutely. Um, the, and uh, you, know, you, you can look at this from a number of different perspectives. We now know, for instance, that trauma is passed on genetically. Right. and triggered by changes in, in circumstances. The implications of that understanding are profound. Going back to this idea of the, the cataclysm between two he heavenly bodies, we are the trauma of the collision of two uh, separate energies. We carry that in us. We carry that, you know, so, so this idea of, um, you know, our being here at the moment, we're here at the moment as an extension in many ways of everything that's gone before and very largely unaware of that. And that's, yeah, you're right, that, that absolutely affects us. I mean, you, you, you can look at this from a number of ways, which is, for me, I, I regard myself first and foremost as human. Uh -huh. It's very interesting when, when you, you introduce people, uh, many people say, start with a, I'm a man or I'm a woman. Very few actually start with a, I'm a human being first. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that yeah. itself automatically creates a division because it separates us at, at the outset from you know, a, a commonality that we share, that we, you know, on this planet, we are all humans. Okay. Now to, to, play, to play in this space a little bit, that's yeah. true. I can absorb that and I can say, okay, I'm human. I'm a human. And that's first and foremost how I see myself. But then I walk out on the street. And because I'm in a woman's body, how my culture responds to me actually is going to sometimes make me defensive. It's going to make me, um, what people think of me, how uh, it may make me either defensive physically or concerned for my physical well being. That's when I say defensive, that's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm but also because a lot of rude or lewd comments can be made. I mean, I was just reading a case the other day about, you know, and this is a very common thing, a woman gets raped and she goes to the police and she, they ask, well, did you say no? Did you fight? Well, no. And so, oh, basically you deserved it because you walked off with the guy. So just, and had, had it been reversed, had it been in a male body, not to mention somebody who is, feels different than who is inside their body. It's going to cause some really interesting um, identity issues. So when we talk about becoming free, to what degree is part of that also embracing the identity you were physically born in? And then we can also touch on if you don't even identify with that uh, identity. Okay, so let's step back. Yeah. For me, another, another reason for understanding, if you like, our biological heritage is to understand then what you do come preloaded with and, 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 and what you are working with. 
and I'll stay with the biology and I'll come, come in, into this, the, the, the social response, if I may. So, yeah, uh, I, I have a male body, and what I've learned is that it has male um, preferences, it has um, male energies, it has certain male responses to things. And when you start to observe those rather than just participate in them, it gives you a, a level of control. You know, in the course of my life, I, I've realized you know, for a good chunk of it, you know, a lot of my responses have been very automatic and they've been driven by my body. You know, they haven't been, you know, um, and you know, that, that has a legitimacy of its own, but it doesn't actually work when you, you're trying to be an aware and conscious, conscious, conscious human being. Right. So, you know, the, the, and from my perspective, that's a question of working within the, if you like, the constraints within which you're given. You know, I wasn't born into a, a female body. I was born into a male body, and you know, my personal take on that is, you know, whatever I might feel within that, I will work with what I've given, uh, what I've been given. The you know, then coming to you know some of the points you touched on in terms of the sociological responses. Mm -hmm. you know, again, if you look at the, the biology, a lot of that isn't thought through. A lot of it comes from you know simian or or, or, or animal behaviour. Mm -hmm. uh, that we are playing out or behavior that's been played out by our ancestors or even you know our, our, our current uh, society mm -hmm. the, 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 you know, the word go as soon as we pop out we soak up everything around us mm -hmm. unless you are immensely self-aware and have some sort of an in, uh, inclination that there is something more right. you have to fight through all of that to get to a point where you know you don't behave like a Stone Age ape, uh, every time you see somebody attractive going down the road. You know, it, 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 it's, it, and, and that for me is one of the reasons why this is you know, it's such an important starting point because we, we assume that we are in control and we assume that we're, we are aware. And yet, you know, I think the latest count is you know, the human brain has 172 uh, cognitive biases towards things or against things such as we have a, an inbuilt preference to things that are familiar and similar. And unless you're aware that that's taking place, that's going to take you for a ride. Yeah. I was blown away with that, you know, the 172 biases. Um, that's, that's quite mind blowing because no matter how much you think you can um, shift or change or be open or unbiased, it's pretty much close to impossible and it seems really the only way to to function is to embrace you to recognize and embrace your biases as much as one can and you know you're you're making me think too that you know I was smiling when you were saying you know being born into a male body and this and and what that means because I'm reminded too of, and we talked about this in our in our prepping conversation for this. You know, I have this very clearly masculine friend who has a full beard and mustache, and but he has discovered that his favorite thing is to dress up in a pink boa and sparkles in his hair, and you know gold leggings and all of this and you know he he shared a story about going out to a bar with with a female colleague of his she was hit on by a guy who and then he stepped in to basically tell the guy like go away and then he sat down with his friend and he offered to buy her a drink um and just but as a friend and she got very defensive and i'm, I'm shifting because this is really about the masculine and feminine playing within one another and the full a full spectrum and so and the biases that come because she automatically assumed that he was hitting on her and he had to like go through a whole conversation with her saying i'm not hitting on you i'm just being a friend because you just had a, a pretty nasty experience with another guy being very aggressive to you and then shortly later that evening he was sitting at the same bar and another guy came, a guy you know came up to him and said dude you're really a straight dude how can that be you're dressed like that and he says yeah that's it and and you know or what is it i guess you're a, you're a cisgender a cis male i guess is the correct term you know you're comfortable in your masculine body 
Um, and, and, uh, and yet you still dress like that and nobody's beating you up. I got to buy you a drink, you know, <laughs> to honor where you are in this. And so it's, it's a really interesting space between what's happening internally and then what's being projected out in the world and where do biases play in that. Um, and I just I want to, there's a comment from Susan and she says, I think the fact we start in the womb with undifferentiated sex speaks to our being human first, which also ties into this too. So. Thank you, Susan. It does, undoubtedly. It, it, it's, and you've touched on something there about the spectrum, which I have come to really appreciate. So having you know, accepted um, the reality of the fact that I'm in, in a male uh, what I would call a male modality. Mm -hmm. like, I, you know, it's not. It, it's it, it is more than just body. You know, it, it, the the energy that I am, if you like, manifesting at, at this point is is a male energy. You know, that that that's how I you know came in, um, came into being. However, what I have found uh, through you know my own exploration is we hold both within us. Mm -hmm. And it was actually in the exploration of the feminine within me, and, and just the accept admittance that that energy was there, mm. that the, I, the masculine in me actually st straightened out and strengthened. Hmm. It, it was, a, it was a, a very revealing process. And I say that because you know, in this space, that's again something that we, we, we deny. Mm -hmm. Idea, you know, we may be very strongly of one modality or another, or not as the case may be. Um, and we, uh, you know, a lot of people, unfortunately, are shoehorned into this view that they, you know, they, they can only be one thing or the other. They can't be both. Mm -hmm. They can't be everything. And so, you know, we end up being divided against ourselves because, you know, everybody has that full spectrum in them. Even if they happen to occupy one spec, uh, one end of it or, or another, in you know, in terms of their physical manifestation, it's such an important um, differentiation between the external gender and the qualities of masculine or feminine, because you can be a very you know and we're seeing this with this shifting in consciousness to be much more accepting of the LBGQTE plus community. Um, that you know ultimately we're, we're humans and how do we make this shift from being in a binary reality to being able to embrace the full the full being and what do we need to do and how can we support that in an evolution because you know by binary means there's always an either or and whenever there's an either or it means you're something you're not and it causes so much pain to so many people it it does. I mean, it, here, you know, it, it, if you wanted to talk about a social bias, for instance, that uh, I think we really need to tackle, it is, and, and this comes from our biological evolution, it is a negative bias towards anything that is different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, if, you, if you look at our society, you know, and, and so, you know, it, it comes in as soon as you know, people start talking about difference in any context it is generally from a negative perspective rather than the other way around which is actually you know, the fact that you and i share far more than we're different mm -hmm. uh, we we have this different yeah you know, the fact that we are different is, is you know that's the miracle that's that that's what's absolutely amazing yeah you know i'm going to interject something here um and i it's something i didn't mention um in the beginning of this call because really first th that this call this conversation is very likely to trigger people to touch on questions or self-awareness issues or challenges that maybe we are that maybe you're aware of or maybe your children or nieces or nephews or siblings or parents even are are struggling with and so as we continue this conversation um for those of you who are watching and listening um i do hope that you will listen from your gut and from your heart and from within your body and see where does this touch on you where where does gender identity gender masculine and feminine principles, where do these things resonate with you? So I, I really invite you to participate within uh, with this conversation and feel free to ask questions or comments, um, but, but to be present with us in this way. So 
sorry, I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I think that when we start talking about what are these, what does it mean, this gender identity and these qualities, where does it touch us and evolution? It's just so relevant for everyone. Um, anyway, it, it is, and and you know, it, 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 again, you know, my worldview, our, our sexual energy is the closest thing to our essence, the, the, you know, the, the energy that we really are inside. And so, you know, it's not just a question of a physicality or an intimacy, it's something deeply bound up with, you know, the, the essence of who we are. And it's powerful. It shapes us, it drives us. I mean, I, I cannot tell you uh, what it felt like when I, when I, you know, as a, as a, a boy, at, at each stage when the testosterone kicked in, it was like fire going around my veins. I had no idea what was going on. Mm. It, you know, it was incredibly um, confusing and overpowering in, in some senses. You know, it, it is, you know, going back to your question, what can we do about it? We can, we can start to understand. And, and, you know, for me, that starting point is it's not out there in the stars and it's not the philosophy. It's actually, okay, what am I living in? Mm -hmm. How does that work? Right. And a uh, you know, recognition of the fact that actually the, the suit, the monkey suit that I'm living in, has been designed basically to live by itself. Actually, human body can get by with remarkably little conscious intervention. Mm -hmm. And that's our challenge. Mm -hmm. you know, C.G. Jung put it, um, you know, our real challenge is to make the unconscious conscious. Mm -hmm. And we do that by understanding. You know, it's unconscious until we start to look at it. And when we start to look at it, we start to understand. And when we start to understand, we start to get a little bit, a bit of perspective. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, that's an interesting thing because it's that, you know, life is a sort of su a subjective, objective process. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is the essence of duality that drives the, the masculine and the feminine. You know, the beauty about this life is the fact that we do have the both, the both, and we are able to both observe and participate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One without the other isn't really very much fun. Right, right. And until you know what's going on, it's actually very confusing. It's a very interesting thing. One without the other isn't very much fun, you know. But again, then that then we get into this duality, right? I need something other than me in order to see myself what's that phrase to know who you are is to know who you are not right and very often the way that that understanding has been evolved has been in because you're not me i should attack you i should fight you or i should make you wrong and so really what i you know the ramifications of this kind of a conversation and and need for self-awareness has huge implications for social structure and and how we work in the world, and again going back to the sustainable the UN uh, sustainable goals, this is you know ultimately social change will begin within ourselves by working on these kinds of issues. Exactly. So imagine what would happen. Yeah, you know, if you go back to the, the comment that I made around, if somebody had told me about the monkey suit to begin with, <laughs> rather than my having to go through 50, 50 plus years to get to a point where it's like okay, I think I'm beginning to understand which way is up and which lead us to pull and how much I am affected by what's going on here simply because I don't give it recognition and I'm not listening to it. I mean, your point about the gut there is a really interesting one. The gut has God knows how many times more neural synapses than the brain. Mm -hmm. So something interesting is happening there and we don't know about it yet. Mm -hmm. So imagine what would happen if we taught our children Precisely that. You're here. This is the context that you're operating in. Mm -hmm. You don't have to find out about this yourself mm -hmm. by trial and error and you know, maybe end up in the wrong place. Certainly have to struggle to get to a point of sanity and balance around things. What would happen if we actually taught our children, no, this, this is the context in which you live. These are the things that are really affecting you. This is what's going on. You know, what, what would happen, for instance, if we taught our, our children to, to feel, you know, to process emotionally? For me, these are, the, you know, the, these are the starting points. If we really want to make social change, mm -hmm. we can do lots of other things, but 
until we understand who we are and how we operate collectively, it's very difficult to make any progress. Mm -hmm. You're reminding me, you know, because a lot of my work is in international development and international policy, but also coming from a background of the healing arts and massage therapy, you know, this gap. So people want to go out and change the world by doing things externally to them. And then you have on one side, oh, we'll bring peace by giving everybody water and food and job. Okay, fine, that's one side. And then you have another sort of group that says, oh no, if we sit and meditate enough, consciousness will shift enough and then there will be world peace. But what has always been missing for me is, well, that's fine, but I'm in this physical monkey suit to use your phrase, in this body. And in that body, I hold every single memory of history and also of the future. And how do I negotiate that? And how do I learn, or rather, when I learn, about this body and how it works and what is my relationship to it and how it affects the outside world, then we can actually have a real conversation and bridge both the truths, if you will, of go out and do social action and also sit and meditate. You know, it's, it's an interesting balance. Uh, and yeah. balance is a good word because it's a dynamic thing. It's not, it is not either or, it's all of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, at the moment we're missing one very important component mm -hmm. and that point you made about holding all of that history when you really start to to appreciate the implications of that is profound so let's look at peacekeeping mm -hmm. you know i was i was in palestine looking down uh, i could see the the wall between palestine and israel and i was looking at a structure and it was very square and it had turrets uh, and it looked like a concentration camp and I turned to my Palestinian friend and I said what's that and he said it's a factory and something in me clicked I realized how much social DNA had been imported into that context. Wait a minute, the, the factory was on the Israeli side or the Palestinian side? It was on the Palestinian side. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, and fascinating. Uh, yeah. You know, effectively, what I was seeing was um, a replication of a pattern. So what we can, you know, when you look at the Middle East and, and you look at Israel in particular, you've had a huge influx from particular cultures. Mm -hmm. We tend to see that only in terms of, if you like, the religious influence and not the national influence. Mm -hmm. And what I saw in that particular instance was, ah, okay, when Israel was founded, a lot of people came from a particular part of Europe and they had a particular way of thinking about things in a particular pattern, mm -hmm. and that's been imported. Mm -hmm. And it was at that moment that I started to think, change, you know, to really achieve lasting peace, you've got to, to be able to recognize that as one of the influences that you've got to, you've got to be able to address. Mm -hmm. And yeah. if you are dealing with social DNA in, in that particular way, that's going to take generations. Mm -hmm. well, right. was, sorry, Lisa. So go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I, it was one of, that was one of the things that actually started me to look at more uh, to look at genetics and the impact of that, for instance, on neuroscience. Mm -hmm. um, and that's when I started to discover there was research taking place to show that trauma had been passed on. So, you know, if you start to peel back those layers, going back to your point, you start to realize actually how much we are holding mm -hmm. and, and then we wonder why it's so difficult to make progress and what's really interesting you remind me too here in the states with the, with the issue of slavery and this is this topic has been explored in um in white and black issues um you know of how much is of the dna of the slaves is uh, is being activated in this struggle the slavery mentality and you know what the, some of the questions that have come up or that i've been looking at is well 
why isn't if there's reparations there's been acknowledgments to give financially and uh, uh with monuments given like there's one university i know of who actually had a history of slave of slavery associated with it very strongly and so the university put up a monument it made a, uh, in in apology in recognition for its past and it also paid each of the descendants that they could prove had lineage to the slaves as best they could um, they gave financial remuneration to these families but that still didn't fully acknowledge the wounding and you know you see this too in south africa with the truth and reconciliation commissions that we may we tried to repair ourselves, but yet there's still a lot of pain and trauma. With that said, though, there are more and more interracial couples, but we're getting more into into society things. So I do want to sort of tie this, bring this back into mm -hmm. the role of gender and and not just gender, but the principles of masculine and feminine and the in need for wholeness. So, oh, do you want to go ahead and go from there? Well. Just to tie that back in, then I mean, it, 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 you know, it could be that could be seen as tangential. But you know, if we're talking, then you know, if you start to recognise the levels of influence, then that operates. At a, a, it does operate in the context of gender very strongly, because you and I come with you know all of the uh, the the if you like the biological orientation, but all of the social orientation towards each other. Mm -hmm. um, from a gender perspective, right, and that you know, clouds the way that we approach each other. To get to a point where actually we can approach each other openly and warmly, simply as human beings, takes a lot of doing. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have to, you know, you really have, I, uh, and, and particularly, I think if, if you feel some of those things very strongly, if there's a strong historic influence, or if the, you know, there's a strong cultural influence around you, or, or indeed, you know. If, if your biology is such that you, know, you, you are particularly you know, orientated in one way or the other, that really is a lot to work through. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I'm thinking about your example, uh, and I'm thinking about walls, and I'm thinking about the construct of buildings and the linearness and the containerness of this. And I'm thinking in the context of the Middle East, um, you know, again, where it's so masculinely dominated. And, and how does that affect our physical space? You know, the buildings that we build. So how our physical world interacts with our inner world is just so, so profound. And I, it, that thinking then made me think more about who you are and what your story is and how you've done this incredible work to embrace your feminine side and I, I now there's another question also from susan that's come up and she says how does it feel um or what is your experience when identifying yourself as a feminist in front of other men and that that question i put to you but i also bring it back to what i was saying because this role this dance that we do and how do we and moving forward individually and socially so You've touched on so you touched on a number of things there. So I, I, I'm going to talk with something because I, I think we may come back to this, mm -hmm. which is okay. Principles and characteristics of the gender. Now I don't really want to, and I don't think it's, it's a good use of time to sort of go into a catalogue of what's different. Mm -hmm. But I've got a very simple model, uh, if you like, for the way I, I I see, if you like, the difference between masculine and feminine as energies, which we both contain uh, uh, and focus on in different degrees. And I see the, the masculine very much as the container mm -hmm. and the feminine as that which is contained mm -hmm. and neither operate well without each other. Now, you know, your, your point about the architecture and the Middle East being um, dominated by masculine energy, I think is exactly on the money. And it, yeah, architecture is very, very revealing for that reason. You know, because it is the you know, the structures are harsh. They're very solid. They're very containing. They're very controlling. They're very restraining, and that's the masculine energy in its negative form. You know, it's not there to hold something to keep it safe. It's there actually to imprison it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
Um, and how is that for you as, so as a man, how, as a, I don't know why I want to ask this. So how does that touch you? Let me ask, let me just go there. How does that touch you as a, as, as a human, as a man? As a man, it's made that simple understanding has made me really reevaluate re my relationships um, in terms of how much. So I, you know, I, I've come to realize that in me, actually, I'm I'm quite strongly masculine in certain ways, mm -hmm. and you know, my response to things is to structure. You know, I see chaos, and I want to structure it. And it's, it's drawn me back into a space of, hold it, how do I do this in a way which doesn't smother it, doesn't control it, mm -hmm. but actually leads it towards being a partnership between what I'm working with and what I'm trying to bring between you and, uh, and me. Mm -hmm. and, and you can see this manifest in, 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 in so many different areas where you know, the masculine and true response to things is to control it, to shut it down, to dominate it. Mm -hmm. And that's, I've become very shy of that. And I, I said to, I said to somebody a while ago, I said, I, I've lost my appetite to leave, leave footprints. <laughs> and that's a very strange space to find yourself in. Particularly for me, because I literally physically used to build buildings and get a lot of satisfaction out of that. But the, 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 for me, this is something that, you know, once you realize it and, and you start to get some perspective on it, it starts to mean something very different. And I realized, for instance, that, you know, a lot of my behaviors before, which I thought were very natural and normal, actually needed to be modified and toned down, to pulled back. Tell me more. Like, can you give an example? So... If I'm always providing, if I'm always structuring, if I'm always the one that's holding the space, that's not really a partnership. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in any context, personal or business or anything else. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, if my inherent um, go-to position, you know, biologically or energetically is, you know, find a solution, structure it, uh, resolve it, contain it, control it. Actually, by becoming a bit more aware of that, I can modify that response, and then it becomes a shared solution. It's a bit like this call. I mean, when, when you first invited me to it, I, I thought, yeah, wow. And then I woke up in the morning, uh, uh, very early hours one morning, and I just started writing a load of stuff down. And life intervened at the about the 7,000 word mark. <laughs> Uh, and I'm happy to share some of this uh, you know, um, uh, 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 afterwards. And then we finally got together last week to do the, the pre-call. And we both agreed it would be much better to do this as sort of very interactive conversation. Mm -hmm. So you talked just a minute ago about all of the masculine side and learning to tame down your masculine side and reevaluate that. To what degree did the feminine play into taming that down and, and relating to it or exploring your feminine side or traits? Exploring my feminine side. Well, it was exploring my feminine side that, re that, that if you like, help take me to the next level of understanding what it means to be a man. And, and for me, this has been a very, a very strange journey. I mean, I, I had, I mean, lots of people have, everybody has a different, different upbringing, different background. I had uh, the peculiarity about my background was, uh, I had almost no limits, which was quite imprisoning. You know, having to find your own limits on things is very hard. And there were no positive role models, masculine or feminine. There were some very negative ones. And so I grew up not really knowing which way was up, um, yet having a very strong sense that there was something better there in, in a much bigger sense than, you know, and, and also very personal. You know, I, I from, from my earliest memory, had a very clear view that you know, life has purpose and it has meaning, and that's, that's more than just me. 
and bound in with that was my personal exploration. And so, you know, I stumbled through all the normal life stages that people go through. And it's been the last 10 years in particular that I started to sort of really wake up to, to what's going on inside. And um, to start to allow and examine the stop, softer side to me, which, you know, I had kept locked up. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I was doing that actually meant that the rest of me was much harder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by unlocking those doors internally and allowing that, uh, you know, uh, you know, allowing yourself to admit that you, know, you have feminine qualities as well as masculine uh, qualities, that's a huge step forward. You know, your, your friend clearly has done this and I can afford that and actually I can, I can relate to it. You know, dress, dressing up is, you know, it's fun and it's a good way, of, you, know, you, you can play with things in a way that's non-threatening to your own self-image mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, and you know, we are very fragile creatures and our self-image is very very important to us sure. it, it takes a lot to get beyond that uh, and again i would say you know, this, this to me is why you know coming back to recognizing what we are is so important because it allows us to focus on who we really are much more easily Mm -hmm. yeah, as soon as I get to a point of understanding what my body is and that it's not me, mm -hmm. actually levels of concern and conditioning will fall, you know, uh, uh, fall away. Mm -hmm. So there's a, to the point of conditioning, there's a, two questions here. One comes from Darcel and she says, if the masculine is structuring and controlling, what is your opinion, are the, what, what, excuse me, what in your opinion are the feminine qualities? It's a really, it, it is a really interesting question, and I'm, I'm not sure I have a good answer to this yet, because it is, yeah, I, I think, in terms of exemplars, the closest I would go to are the, 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 the principles of Shakti and Shiva. You know, they're, they're both principles of life. Mm -hmm. But they, 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 they are two sides of the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I see you know, the, the, the feminine as having, and it's an interesting thing here, yeah, uh, to say from a, a male perspective, that the, the, the feminine is where the, the creative energy is, the spontaneity is, mm -hmm. the exploration uh, is. Now that cannot live without the structure, and the structure cannot live without that. I was laughing at this because you and I had we we've touched on this question before and there's a lot of sort of newer thinking if you will about the feminine is the the sort of why to your point the feminine is the wild side needing to be contained by the masculine and and then it's that interplay that space between the two where um where in her wildness, she needs to work with the boundaries, right? And mm -hmm. the boundaries need to work with the wildness. It's sort of like if you think of a of a, a glass of water, it's sort of a malleable rather than a static glass, so that they can shape shift and dance together and potentially move through life. Um, that's the positive side of that idea, perhaps. Um, but where it has become very distorted in a lot of religions then is that the, the masculine is going to be so busy containing the feminine that he's going to make sure that he is out protecting her and she stays at home and <laughs> takes care of all of the stuff because he's out being the protector. And so it's the distortion of this principle. Um, did hey, you? Yeah. That's exactly right. I mean, that, 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 that glass is what I call, call my coffee cup analogy. Mm. Uh, except you know, the coffee cup is more like a pressure cooker mm. if, in, the, in the mode that you've just described, which is you know, it's trying to, to contain something. And if you look at that, you know, our body is a really good analog about this, which is you know, they are a mix, you know, the, the, this beautiful mixture of structure and fluidity. You know, every cell uh, in, in the body does, has a boundary and it needs that boundary there to keep it there mm -hmm. uh, uh, to, do, to do its function. Without that, it can't operate. And 
yet equally if it's just the shell it, it, it it's it's empty and you know that, that that's the taste of much of our life at the moment which is it's just the shell mm -hmm. you know we've got the structures there but we don't have the life mm -hmm. and and this is where you know from my perspective you know i you know you and i um you know our souls have been around for not nearly as long as this dualistic struggle between these two energies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and one of the reasons why I was just so humbled when I, I was thinking about it earlier, which is you know, to even you know, contribute a word in, in, in terms of bridging that divide and you know, moving from the, you know, that war to, towards some peace mm -hmm. um, it is, you know, it, it's a great honor. It, it, it's yeah, it, it is, it's a huge struggle for us. Yeah. It, 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 and yet the prize is great. You know, if, if we can get to a point where we can set aside the negative connotations of the differences right. and actually start to work together, that's, yeah, that's just amazing. Yeah. So there's one more question, and I'm getting to be aware of our time. Um, so we have about eight minutes left. So. Um, this is actually from Sandy, who, Sandy Hart, who is the director of the Women and Girls Sector. And she says, the R2R, Reaction to Response Initiative, was developed as a program of the Charter for Compassion International Women and Girls Sector to address and elevate the awareness that we can choose to move away from reactionary impulses to the awareness of responding. What skills, tools, advice can you give us to continue this conversation, develop programming of bringing a balance between the divine masculine and the divine feminine to accomplish this goal and bring this to a critical mass that we can reach through our network and our partners? Good question. Good question. It is a very good question and it's a very rich field. Uh, it, it, the way the question's framed suggests there might be one answer and, and there, there are many answers to this. I think my starting point, and it's one of the reasons why, so as you're aware, Lisa, I do a lot of work with organizations. You know, I, I, you know, I do, in some senses, I describe myself as a change catalyst. I change the way organizations, teams, and people behave. Mm -hmm. And you know, the behave word, I accent there very deliberately because that's the thing that we, we always think we can, we can implement a new organization structure or we can implement a new set of values or whatever. It's actually the behavior that we need to change. Mm -hmm. And the behavior is, is driven by the things that we value. Mm -hmm. And one of the th reasons I became really interested in neuroscience uh, is you know, the piece work I was doing in the Middle East and looking, we, we were looking at the barriers to, you know, what were the real barriers to lasting peace? They're not political. Mm -hmm. you know that's just the, the entry stakes right you know, what is it when you start to recognize what's behind all of the difference there and this is a situation where i was having it you know i'd have a meeting in the morning with the palestinian team i'd drive through the wall and have a meeting in the afternoon with a completely unrelated um uh, israeli team working on something completely different and it really struck me that the 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 degree of conditioning that we hold is so great there mm -hmm. and recognizing this as the first step that you know there are no quick solutions for me the second step then was actually recognizing what we carry you know, what are the implications of our biological evolution genetics plays a part in that very specifically then that led me into neuroscience and there have been some fascinating developments in the last few years that have started to link up in a way that even five years ago you couldn't draw the the same conclusions mm -hmm. so i start here by really you know starting to understand how our brains work mm -hmm. because that gates how we interact with our with ourselves but also with each other and if we can then you know, start to recognize that, we can start to build approaches that cater for that. Mm -hmm. If we can educate people into being aware of what's going on internally, it will stop them. I mean, I saw a fascinating um, TED talk the other day, um, a chap called um, Robert uh, Sapolsky, mm -hmm. and he did, um, and I'll provide the link afterwards if you like, 
he did this fantastic timeline about, okay, you're in a dark street at night, there's a commotion going on, you have a gun, um, somebody comes up to you holding, brandishing something, you shoot them. Now, you and I think about that as that's, that might have been a conscious act of self-defense. He goes through a fantastic lineup of actually how that decision making was influenced by, yes, what was happening in the moment, but what was happening in the couple of hours before, I, were you tired, were you hungry, were you mm. defensive? Was your frontal cortex shut down because it was tired and hungry and therefore your amygdala had more control and therefore you were being more reactive rather than responding? Mm. So get you know, the, the, and then he draws that back into what's your diet been in the last three months? What are the environmental factors? And actually draws it back through millions of years of all the things that have come together that could incline you to behave in a particular way in that moment. It's not to say you will behave in that way, but they incline you towards it. Now, my point here is, until you understand those inclinations, they're going to influence you far. Uh-oh. Uh-oh, we lost you. Okay, it seems that we lost Anthony. Ax, um, I'm assuming he will come back. And it was where we just got left with like almost a seasonal cliffhanger. <laughs> um, let's see, well, so, we do have about another three minutes and hopefully he will come back. But in the meantime, um, I would like to encourage you, I'd like to hear some of your comments. Feel free to, to put a comment in the chat section or a further question. How is this touching you? Um, you know, I, I find this topic so, so relevant. Um, you know, and especially now we're in, we're in June, the Pride Month, which is really about embracing the different genders and not, all of all gender identity um, and how the masculine and the feminine touch into that and who do we choose to be internally and externally and how do we live in the world. Um, so I'm going to hold on and put one more pause here for just one second. Um, we are, we do have about two minutes left and I think probably the best thing to do is We'll just give it another minute here and see that see if uh, see if Ax can join us again. Um, but in the meantime, I will. We're going to put up the after party slide. So hopefully, by the time Ax comes back, uh, perhaps he will. will just jump into the the after party, um, and when you, which you should be able to see on your screen now. Um, it's the, the URL is http colon backslash backslash bit.ly backslash CCIR2R. And then of course, if you can't join us by video, you can feel free to call in on the phone. The numbers below, those are both US based numbers. So if you're calling from overseas, you would need of course a, what is it? 001, I believe. And there is the meeting ID. Uh, also, you can follow us on Facebook, and we have a reaction to response uh, web page, uh, excuse me, Facebook page, where we list um, themes of our, our topics uh, and also upcoming dates. Our next reaction to response date will be June 19th with Arno uh, Michalis, who is a former um, white nationalist, supremacist, supremacist sorry, <laughs> uh, and it looks like now we have Axe back. Hey, Axe. So perfect timing in coming back. We were actually just going over the last of the um, information for the after party, but because we are now at one minute left to the hour. Um, do you want to say anything in conclusion before we, or finish your thought <laughs> before we go over into the after party? <laughs> well, first of all, I'm going to apologize to every, everybody. That was my fault. The laptop died. Oh. as I disconnected the power in order that it wasn't going to make a whirring that noise in the background. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, first of all, I would like to thank you, Lisa, and I'd like to thank everybody on the call for, for, for being here, and I hope that uh, I, made, I said something that made some sort of a sense. I would like to leave you with a question. So this thing about masculinity, I have come to appreciate in the course of the last few years, the truth in the 
and I don't know if this is actually a Native American saying or not, but it, you know, it has a certain charm about it. It certainly captures something for me, which is you know, the, the role of man is that woman may dance freely upon the earth. And I've come to really appreciate that um, as, a, you know, as a sentiment about uh, a, a positive manifestation of male energy. And I'd like to leave you all with a question, which is, if that's the definition of the masculine, what's the definition of the feminine? Right. I don't have an answer to that one, but I'd sure like to know what it is, because I'm, I'm really interested in partnership here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, and that's what I want to help build. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it's a, it's a good question, which we can, can continue. And certainly it's a very relevant question because uh, it's, it hasn't been really addressed very well, not, not in the context of partnership, which by the way, ties into a lot of the work Rianne Eisler does through the Center for Partnership um, and who was our previous guest. So we're one minute after the hour. And so we're gonna take a minute to thank you, Ax, for your wisdom and, and generosity of spirit and also for all of the work that you've done yourself internally, because by, through that work, you're reflecting really the practice that we're hoping to support people in evolving into is self-awareness and self-reflection and peacemaking internally so that it can reflect out in the world. So thank you for the work you do. And thank you for being with us. And we will now, um, for those of you and who can join us, please do. Uh, we'll see you hopefully in the after party. Um, and I hope everyone has that link now. So we, Mimi, you want to put that up again? again that's great. And um, I think that's it. We're good. And well, there's a lot of thank yous and there's still some comments, but we can bring those over into the after party. And uh, everyone else, we hope to see you next week with Arno McAllis. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.